Lamanaseach al Hagithith, Livne Koran. Of the sons of Korah. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out to the living God. Even a sparrow finds a house, a swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young near your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, the happiness of those who live in your house, they are still praising you. Salah. The happiness of the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the sacred roads. Passing through the valley of tears, they make it a place of springs. The first rains clothe it with blessings. They will go from strength to strength until they see the God of gods in Zion. Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. God of Jacob, listen, Salah. Look upon our shield, O God. Look upon the face of your Messiah. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather choose to be a doorman in the house of my God than to live in the tents of the unrighteous. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. He holds back no good thing from those who walk in integrity. Lord of hosts, the happiness of the man who trusts in you. I remember one of the things that um, Malcolm and I would talked about when we first started doing these um, um, uh, these conversations was the way that when when poets get together they they often talk as much about the um the way poems are organized within a collection um as 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 about the individual poems because that affects the whole way you read it and yeah. I mean, I've, I've got a poetry collection just coming out and that was actually you know it's been <laughs> very much been my focus because it does sort of change things and it is actually part of the way um the, the 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 poems are read, and I was very fascinated by what you say about the 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 arrangement of the, the these kind of two collections of the poems by the the sons of Korah and the mm -hmm. sons of Asaph. And I just wondered if you you could tell us a little bit about that. Um, yes, I think Psalm forty two, which we looked at about a few months ago, and eighty four are just so similar. They both long to be at the temple. They're probably both distance from it and not able to, to be there. They both use surprising expressions about God's the temple being God's dwelling place, about God being the living God, an, an unusual expression, and Elohe hey, it is in Hebrew, and then uh, the word for my God is um, Elohe. Hey. So there's a sort of play on words, and each psalm has got this sort of, this play, and um, several other things one could would, could argue are, are, are very similar. So the question is, what on earth is Psalm 42 doing way, way back in the Psalter, and what's 84 doing here? And each of them has got a heading over to Psalm of Korah, and Psalms 42 to 49 are a little group of Psalms of Korah, all centred on Different, in different ways about longing to be in the temple or, 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 or to do with God's presence in the temple. There are just two exceptions. And then we, we've been doing these dreadful Psalms of Asaph feeling very much under God's judgment and the temple being destroyed. And suddenly we come to 84, which like 42 and 3 is actually very much longing to be in the temple. And it's a Psalm of Korah. And it seems as if there are two collections probably united at one time, which the compilers of the Psalter have split up and put in the middle of, of it a huge stretch of Psalms from 51 to 72, which is the Davidic Psalter, and then the Asaphite Psalms, the Psalms of Asaph, which come on 73 to 83. So it's interesting how they were organising things and why they decided to start in book two with yearning for the temple and God's presence and ending in book three, which is what we're doing now, um, with the God's presence um, still 
yearning to be there and 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 um yes the two the two are linked and the collections are quite interesting in that in that sense yeah and it does i mean and as we were saying it does actually change the way you read it doesn't it when, yeah. when you have yeah. that sort of desperation yeah. and then suddenly you a yeah. glimpse of something more which is very much part of the theme of this psalm anyway yes exactly yes it's, um, yeah, yes. I wonder if uh, there's a bit of, you know, like the old Joni Mitchell song about don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. <laughs> those psalms about the destruction suddenly kindle the yearning that yes. one's had. Yes, yes. Someone takes an older poem of yearning when the temple hadn't been destroyed and puts it yeah. here yeah. because it expresses, certainly, I mean, well, in my own thing, it was very much, yeah. I being able to walk into my parish church, you know, and worship completely for granted until it was denied me. Mm -hmm. then yeah. i got in touch with my yearning yes mm -hmm. yes yes well i mean that's well, actually well, i'll come to that in a moment because that's uh but it's i mean that sort of kind of existential the way the the, the psalm has actually speaks to something quite deep within people is 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 mm -hmm. one of the lovely things about this psalm. i just can't because you you mentioned it and i just i had no idea this is true that all well, maybe it's not true but it's anyway the story that um that this psalm was actually quite important for thomas aquinas in his <laughs> in his own journey which you mentioned <laughs> that's right a day in your courts especially in a thousand yes exactly it's that it's that verse about him i'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of god um uh, and then dwell in the tents of the wickedness and so on that's very much it seems the verse that uh, inspired aquinas to join the dominican order yeah well <laughs> No, it's it's a very good motto for a teacher, since it's a teaching and yes. preaching order. I mean, yes. a teacher should essentially see themselves as doorkeepers. I think as opening doors of learning, not not yes. teaching everything, but opening the door to other people to be able to go in and explore. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Before we before we go on, perhaps I can just um, welcome you to. Um, Thank you for joining the, these conversations again. I, I always sort of say that they're they're based on the books the three of us um, wrote during lockdown. Um, Malcolm's um, uh, David's Crown, 150 poems responding to the 150 psalms. Uh, uh, Sue's Psalms Through the Centuries, which is a, a, both a commentary and a reception history of all the 150 psalms. And um, my more limited um, selection of, uh, uh, of, of illustrated translations of the psalms. But actually, in this case, Psalm uh, 84 uh, isn't one that I included in, the, uh, in, in this selection, though it does come in the... Um, uh, in the handbound um, versions that I, I, I did of, of, of the Psalms. And one of the reasons that I didn't actually in, in, include it in the selection is that I wasn't quite happy with the the illustrations. So I'd taken this, um, the the image of the, of the swallow um, on its nest. But when I've th been thinking about it, I just sort of felt that the, the psalmist must have had this picture in his mind of all the of swallows sort of roosting under the eaves of the of the temple and sort of going in and out. And I mean, Malcolm, in your your poem, you actually had this lovely image of um, of sort of um, swallow flights as, uh, of song, yes. which which has the, I know this sort of Tennysonian. Um, yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. Uh, it was the. So I, I wanted to just mention that this this I, I said yearning towards the beauty of his temple in swallow flights of song. That's an allusion to I mean it's an allusion to seeing swallows floating in and out of churches, but it's also an allusion to Tennyson's in memoriam, the sort of prayer diet prayer poetry diary he kept over many years, working through his grief for his friend Arthur Henry Hallam. And he one point he characterizes the poems. They're short lyrics. They're beautiful short lyrics, but they amount in the end to you know 150 something. You know, rather like the sounds. So he refers to them the poems as brief swallow flights of song that dip their wings in tears and then skim on. You know, and uh, and uh, and so uh, yeah, there was a little nod to Tennyson there, which is uh, is. I mean, for, it's lovely actually because it it refers also, I suppose, to that to that sort of second part of the psalm, um, where where it talks about the the valley of of Baca and the um, um, becoming sort of um, pools of um, uh, yeah. The, I mean, Coverdale has it who going through the veil of misery, use it for a well, and the pools are filled with water. But of course, mm -hmm. that's been translated 
and referred to in in a lot of English literature mm. became a, as the veil of tears. Um, mm. You know, and the I idea think it's that... interesting how Coverdale has taken that from the Latin and before that the Greek, because the Latin and the Greek do trans look see the Hebrew word which is bakar, which can mean to weep, and have taken it in a in a sense of weeping rather than in, in the more literal sense, which could be literally a valley of baka, a valley which has sort of rather bitter balsam shrubs in it, yeah. which is just outside Jerusalem, which pilgrims to Jerusalem would have passed, gone through in order yeah. to get to Jerusalem. So there's both a literal and a metaphorical, yeah. it's interesting, Coverdale. Well, it's both and, and, isn't it? I mean, there's the phrase in Coverdale, isn't the, the verse before, blesses the man who strengthens thee, in whose heart are thy ways. Mm. And I feel this constantly with the poetry of the of the Psalms. And I guess maybe this is a characteristic you could tell me, Sue, of Hebrew poetry. That you're mm. not supposed to choose between the outer and the inner. It's mm. always mm. like Ruach is wind and spirit or, you know. Mm. It, so I always feel it's the outer valley, but it's also the inner valley. And I don't have to choose between them. Mm. A bit yeah. like Psalm 23. The valley of the shadow of death, the sheep yeah. going through the valley, but the valley is our you know, is the experience as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the other thing I think we want to say, in, I mean, you're, there's obviously within the psalm, there's this sense of the sort of the, the beauty of actually being in, in the presence of God, oh, yeah. in, which is just lovely. But, I mean, but your your poem has this very particular kind of, uh, I mean, you, you, you were saying before, of, of the kind of lockdown sense. When yeah, you, well, as, as you know, this was a kind of, I mean, lockdown prayer journal in a way. I was exercising myself in the psalms when I, went out for my morning exercise and by the time we got I'd got to 84 you know we'd recovered at least from the initial thing where churches were sort of locked and you couldn't go at all we still weren't being permitted to gather for services but it had been agreed certainly in our diocese that you could go that the church doors were not to be locked and that you had to sign a list to say you'd been there in case they needed to track down infections later. And I think there was a high tech version where you scanned a thing as well. And um, using your app, you showed who you were, even though the church would be completely empty. But then you could go in and you could be still and you could pray. Mm. And this psalm, this poem arose specifically. I mean, it was written on the day that I was able to go back yeah, yeah. to our parish church in Linton, St. Mary's Linton, and just, uh, you know, feel the joy again of being there and realise how much the place, the building itself had to teach me, which which was, you know, mm -hmm. since this empty church is, is full. So, I mean, um, you'll hear it when I read the poem. Yeah, I mean, it's very much the same with us initially. The there's this one 12th century church where there is actually just by where the altar used to be. There's this beautiful little carving of a of a swallow <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or a sparrow, sort of um, you know, just in the corner, <laughs> which is um, which I remember sort of preaching on. I had to preach on this um, there um, on this psalm. But I mean, perhaps there's actually so much more we could say about this psalm because it's just it's so so rich. Um, and it's um, but, but but perhaps we ought to um, to hear the 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 poem. Um, yes. I mean, eighty four is one of the great favourites, isn't it? Lots and lots of people know mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, quoted yeah. it definitely. My mother used to quote it quite often. So anyway, Psalm eighty four, quam delecta. Yahweh saves. Our God is merciful, and how I long to enter in His courts to nestle at his altar and to dwell with him forever. Day and night my thoughts are yearning towards the beauty of his temple in swallow flights of song. For in his courts, time is transfigured, opened out and ample. It touches on eternity. I stay a while within this quiet church. Its simple furnishings and storied windows say more to me of heaven than the pale abstractions of theology. A day spent in an empty church has been as full of goodness as an age elsewhere. I feel its peace refresh me like a holy well. That was my, my little dip on the using the pool as the well. <laughs> yes. I think that's lovely. It's such a 
Uh, it's a strange thing that actually empty churches can have this effect, really, aren't they? Even, uh, even when nothing yeah, is. Empty. I think there was a thing on the radio today where somebody was doing a thing about even if you're a secular person, there's something astonishing about going into churches. There was a little light mode on the on yeah. the lunchtime program, I think, you know, in Radio Four, saying mm -hmm. they are for you. They're still there for you, whoever you are. Yeah.